That was that was great music. So, all right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session in our AI virtual tech talk series. Uh, my name is Mary, and I work in the AI ecosystem team at ARM, and I will be your moderator today. This is our third session in the series. If you missed the other two, you can see them anytime on demand by going to ARM's YouTube channel. This one will be available there also in a couple days. Um, and after we finish the, today's presentation, uh, you'll receive a quick survey, and I would love it if you filled it out. Um, we want to hear from you. We're trying to evolve these and you know, want to understand um, you know, what you think about it. Um, so let's get to it. So beaming in all the way from France are Joe Rubino and Francois de Rochebouet from Cartesium, um, who are also an AI ecosystem partner. They joined our, our partner program a few months ago, and we're so excited to have them on board. Um, so Joe, Francois, how are you guys doing today? Fantastic. It's Bastille Day here in Paris, uh, in France, so it's a great day for us. That's right. What do you say, vive la France? Yes. <laughs> oh, your, your French is perfect. Ah! <laughs> That's um, so, um, Joel, uh, I understand you are the co-founder and CEO of uh, Cartesium. But um, aside from doing that, which is a big accomplishment in itself, um, I, I understand you are a jazz musician. Uh, you've also climbed a tiny little mountain called uh, Mount Kilij Kilimanjaro. Um, and then when you're not doing that, you're kind of paragliding all around. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about any of that? Um, it's totally amazing. Well, uh, so first of all, uh... Thank you very much for uh, welcoming us in this uh, webinar session. Uh, this is a great honor for us to be uh, with uh, you and with the rest of the team here on, the, on this webinar. Uh, yeah, so I'm co-founder. I'm uh, with a lot of uh, uh, guys here at Cartesium. We are roughly 20. And uh, when we don't enjoy the life at Cartesium, it's true that uh, I love uh, jazz music. I'm very fortunate since I live in Paris and we have a lot of uh, uh, jazz club over there. I played the guitar. Uh, I met uh, with the current band uh, 23 years ago when I was on assignment in the US. Uh, I made a couple of uh, friends and we, we formed uh, our first group called the Five Frogs Jazz Band. Yeah. <laughs> it was French. Awesome. And then uh, yeah. we moved in Paris in the year 2000 and, uh, and, and, and then we, had, uh, we still have that band. So we still play and it's true. I love uh, climbing. I love uh, I love uh, piloting and paragliding and things like that. So yeah, I have a busy life, but it's, it's great. You do, you do. That's, that's awesome. Um, and Francois, so I see these little, these uh, little I won't say little, these, these amazing skateboards in the background. So uh, tell us about those. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, uh, those are homemade uh, electric uh, longboards. Uh, because uh, in terms of personality, I'm a, a maker guy, so I pass my day on a website like uh, Hackaday. Um, I like to do things by myself. And uh, as an entrepreneur, I, I created uh, previously for uh, companies. So I'm a maker in terms of uh, companies and things like uh, those uh, electric skateboards. Yeah. So where do you ride them? Do you ride them around? Is there, is there, there some good like? Pavement to go cruising. Every day, on. every day, uh, I go to I drive drive <laughs> the kids yeah, to commute, school. You on your longboard commute to yes. work. Yes, <laughs> we go to school together with the kids, and then I go to the office. Um, That's awesome. Every day, right? That is the life. Yes. Cool. Um. All right. Well, are you guys uh, are you guys ready to get into this? Absolutely. All yeah. right. Um. Okay, so we're gonna um, answer questions during the presentation. So I think um, if everybody's familiar by now with <laughs> Zooming constantly, um, just hit the Q&A button and we'll get to some questions during the presentation. Um, and also today we're gonna try something new. Um, after the presentation, we're gonna hang on for about 10 minutes or so. And for any of you who wanna actually ask questions verbally, you know, if you, you know, raise your hand, um, we will um, unmute you and you can just talk to Joel um, and Francois directly and ask some questions. We have not done this before, so we'll see how it goes. 
And um, yeah, so let's, uh, Joel, you're on. Let's, uh, let's take it away. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, so, um, so we prepared this deck and we prepare also a nice presentation for you today, real life presentation. Francois is going to do that later on. So um, our focus at Cartesian is really on the embedded developers community. Uh, and most of what you are going to see today is, uh, is really about uh, how to make their life easier. Um, and one of the goal is really to make a uh, object self-aware. So we try to help the developers to make objects self-aware. So the agenda for today, I'm going to take uh, uh, 10 minutes max uh, to tell you more, a little bit more about who we are and the try of the kind of problem we try to solve. And then Francois is going to use most of the time, uh, I think 35, 40 minutes, uh, to do a live creation of a smart sensor. He's going to, uh, to use a, a fan, a PC fan, uh, and he's going to show you very nice things using the studio and how to do anomaly detection, and then we'll open up uh, for questions. Okay, so uh, Cartesian, um, uh, like you said, Mary, we are based in France, uh, in uh, Toulon, which is the south of France, which is where Francois and uh, all the, 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 the research and development team uh, are based. As far as I'm concerned, I'm based in Paris, uh, and we have offices in, uh, in the US, in New York, where uh, Mark is, is uh, based for the last uh, 25 years. Uh, he's one of the co-founders as well. And uh, we have, uh, since a few uh, months now, an office in Germany, in, uh, in Munich, to address the, the German market. So we started the company in 2016 with only one focus, which is uh, machine learning at the edge. And uh, our mission is live in life is really to help the developers. And uh, honestly, today we are going to talk a lot, a lot about the developer community, not so much about the data scientists, the developer community to, to help them to create smart objects without any AI skills. Um, one of the innovation that Francois will show you later on today is uh, that we are able to do the training inside the microcontroller, which make our solution very unique on the market. And in terms of team, uh, mainly the team is mathematicians. Uh, we have PhDs in advanced mathematics, <coughs> learning, signal processing, some uh, developers, embedded developers, uh, of course, and Francois, the CTO, is leading of this team. So uh, we believe that uh, today uh, there is a, a, a use of the word AGI uh, that is misleading because uh, today you're talking about AGI, we talk about uh, training and inference. And uh, we believe that uh, they are very different. Uh, the training today is mainly done uh, on a GPU, on a CPU, sometimes in the cloud. And uh, the inference is done at the edge in the device on the microcontroller. Uh, the problem is uh, with the current approach, uh, we believe that uh, talking with most of our customers, that uh, the current AI approach is somehow irrelevant and most of the projects don't go any further than a proof of concept. Why? Because when you want to do the training, it's, it's really hard. And uh, we uh, here at bottom left, uh, you have a present, uh, the study from Gartner say that uh, the top three challenge for uh, AI and machine learning adoption is uh, number one and number two are get data set and get data scientists. Uh, getting the data is, 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 is really something uh, that uh, is extremely complicated, not if you want to do just a demo, but if you in the real life when you're in the industry. Uh, so gathering the data, cleaning the data, labeling the data, meaning I'm not going to tell you uh, all the different tasks, you know that. It's really a very uh, strong challenge. And then on top of that, uh, you need to access data scientists. And uh, I was reading a uh, uh, the other day, uh, a study that say that uh, today, just in the US, there are 170,000 jobs available for data scientists. So uh, not only it's difficult to get the data, but uh, assuming you have the data, then you need to have the data scientist to work with the data and to work with, to create the algorithm and define the hyperparameters and do all that stuff. And you don't have these resources. And this is why today, uh, we are in a, in a kind of bottleneck because, uh, because of that. So it's expensive, it takes years, it's complex, and 
today we don't see that many projects. So to solve this equation, uh, we see two options. Option number one that is taken by some of the companies, it is, well, let's make this training part easier. Uh, let's try to simplify. So we quote unquote teach to embedded developers how to do a data scientist job uh, in an, uh, a more uh, and simpler way. That's not the approach we have taken with Cartesium. We've taken an, another option, which is uh, why don't we create a development environment that runs on PC, on Windows or Linux, Ubuntu. And uh, in that environment, development environment, you create a library and you give the power of this library to do the learning and the training inside the microcontroller. So you directly eat the data directly on the machine. You catch the data directly on the machine. So you do a kind of dynamic learning directly on the device. And this studio, again, running on your PC with no connection to the cloud will give you a library. And then this library uh, can run on any ARM Cortex-M uh, microcontroller from M0 to M7 and can be used by any uh, embedded developer. Uh, so how did we do that? Uh, well, basically the first three years of Cartesium, we've been working only to, uh, with the data scientist guys, so our PhDs, to rewrite from scratch every single machine learning algorithm as well as signal processing algorithm so they can run inside the microcontroller. So not execute the library, but run inside the microcontroller. So we started again back from the algebra, really from the mathematics. That was the first three years of Cartesian. So this is a reason why our, uh, uh, our libraries today are very optimized and uh, very small in terms of size is because starting from day one, we've been thinking inside the box, which is the microcontroller. So we are not guys coming from the server world. We, are, we have been operating since day one on a microcontroller. And the result is, uh, is a kind of search engine, basically. You will define some parameters like uh, how much library, uh, how much memory for your library, uh, are you using M0, M3 or whatever. Uh, what kind of sensor do you use, etc. And Francois will show you that in a few minutes. And then uh, the search engine is going to go through the 500 million uh, potential libraries. 500 million is a combination between all the machine learning algorithm, the, the signal processing al algorithm, and all the IP parameters. So if you combine all of that, you have 500 million potential combination. And so the search engine is going to go through all these combinations and try to find the best library for your project. So uh, today, when you look at the, 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 the family of uh, uh, Cortex M microcontrollers, you see that it's recommended that uh, uh, M4 to M7 are well suited for machine learning and DSP application. What we want to do with uh, our engine, uh, our ID, is to make sure that uh, now we can uh, go below and beyond uh, into the M1, M0, M23, etc. So any microcontroller can run uh, a machine learning library. So, and we've run machine learning libraries on, on very small uh, uh, library size of uh, less than one kilobyte and on M0. So Francois will talk about that later on. So today, where are we? Um, so we've set up a partnership with a uh, big guys, of course, like ARM, uh, where we are an AI partner. And this is one of the reasons why we are here today with ST Microelectronics. And we are <coughs> uh, an AI partner of ST Microelectronics. Francois, can you go on mute, please? And, uh, and then we are uh, also partner of Analog Device, Silicon Lab, and uh, I forgot on this chart on, of uh, Microsoft. Um, ST Microelectronics tested our technology and they say that we blew their minds. So this is always something nice to, to read from uh, uh, such a big player like uh, ST Microelectronics. In terms of analysts, uh, the Gartner uh, put us in the hype cycle for semiconductor and electronic as one of the top three AGI vendor last year and last week for 2020. So it's a, it's a great accomplishment. Uh, they also put us as a cool vendor for 2020. We won a couple of prizes, uh, 
for uh, main sentence of Congress, IoT World Congress, and you can see name of uh, some of the customers we have today because they are uh, uh, customers using our technology, like Schneider Naval Group, which is uh, the French Navy, and 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 some and some others. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, examples of usage of our technology, we start with the first one. So again, we do anomaly detection. Don't pretend to do uh, uh, AI. Uh, in a broad sense, we focus on anomaly detection, which is very good for three cases. The first one is uh, predictive maintenance, anti-fraud detection, and security. So in terms of predictive maintenance, Bob Assistant is a, a, a very small device uh, that you put on any machine. For a few days, it will listen to the machine, the vibrations of the machine, create and train a model inside the microcontroller, inside uh, the, the device and then after a few days it will switch from learning to inference and continuously analyze the vibration in order to detect if there is a vibration between the model that has been created inside Bob versus the new uh, the new uh, vibration in case of problem it will connect to the LoRa network and send uh, an information to the network to say hello Houston we have a problem then we have uh, um, uh, the second one, which is a home appliance uh, leader. We cannot name at the moment. They are doing an air conditioning system. And uh, we use actually the microcontroller, the existing microcontroller, which is in the motor control of the, the, the air conditioning system to, to take a snapshot of the, the current. And we analyze at 25 kilohertz the shape of the current live inside uh, the air conditioning system in order to detect uh, filter uh, clogging. Uh, the beauty here is uh, with a static model done in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, offsite, you, you, you will have to anticipate all the different, uh, uh, let's say, filters. Uh, the beauty here is if you switch the filter uh, by another filter, which is not uh, a genuine filter from the brand, with a different uh, density, etc. Since you start the learning again on the same uh, machine, uh, then you will have a new characteristic and then the inference will be done on this new filter, even if the filter is not an original one. And then the last one is uh, the French Navy, which is, used our, which is using our uh, technology. We have absolutely no idea what they are doing with it. Because again, the solution is a PC running, uh, running on a PC and, uh, and uh, and in terms of confidentiality, we have a lot of customers that don't want to send their production data uh, to the cloud. So this is a, this is a very good uh, point. Uh, in terms of signal, we are using uh, most of the signal. We are not using uh, video and voice at the moment for many reasons. Uh, microcontroller might not be the, the best, uh, let's say, uh, uh, hardware for this kind of uh, uh, signal treatment. Uh, and we believe also that uh, our customer in the industry they want, uh, when you use video and voice, you think like a human. When you use a vibration and magnetic and temperature, you think like a machine. And, and we, 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 we tell our customer, you need to think like a machine more than a, like a human, because this voice and, and video, voice and sorry, and video, yes, they are the sensor that we as human have. Magnetic sensor, we don't have only the dolphins and the pigeons have a magnetic sensor, but this is very good sensor for uh, an, um, uh, predictive maintenance, for example. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to my buddy Francois, who is going to show you a live demonstration of the studio. Uh, Francois, over to you. Okay, thank you, Jordan. And let me share my screen. Share. Okay. So you should see me. And yeah, yeah. here you should see my very short PowerPoint. I'm not a PowerPoint addict, as you can may imagine. But I, I just wanted to to put some uh, guidelines on on the the idea of the today presentation. So the idea today is to create together a, a smart sensor based on uh, embedded machine learning uh, algorithm. And the idea is to monitor fans, PC type of fans. So let's uh, do it. And we will uh, do it without any mathematics involved, <laughs> without any server, cloud, or connectivity from the sensor. 
it may take us like 20 minutes to do the algorithm, the main algorithm. And it will run on a Cortex-M and this one is an M4, a standard one, nothing fancy. Uh, it may use less than 10 kilobytes of RAM and works on every PC fan on, on Earth. Uh, just you to, to understand the, the philosophy uh, behind Cartesian. Um, usually when you create, uh, when you think about embedding uh, machine learning in a smart sensor, um, the way to do it is, the first step is to grab data as Joel told you. So maybe you will find some fans and you will collect some data from there put them in a database using a machine learning engine like TensorFlow, for example, you will create a static model and this model will be sent inside the devices to use it as a inference. The problem you have is you will never be sure to, to grab, to give this engine all the possibilities on the market because there are huge variety of things in real life of behavior in real life. So it's a huge challenge. And um, most of the time, uh, it's where, where is the difference between a POC and a real product. So the, the way we think about it is not to try to create a model, but more to try to create an engine. So we will create a machine learning engine that fit the project that is monitoring the fans. And this typical engine will be copy inside every devices, smart devices. And they will run inside and create the specific model of this, this specific fan. This one will be a different one, this one, this one, this one, all the fan you want. So this, this is the trick. This is the why it's different, uh, a different approach. So let's um, deep dive. Um, let's start with, uh, so here I've got the, you, you may see on my screen, um, the embed the studio just to show you that uh, here i will put my sensor so it's a cortex m4 a board from st microelectronics using an accelerometer nothing uh, special here and here i just put a rgb light so we can see the the status of the the, the sensor and here you can see flowing the data uh, vibration data from uh, the device so i will turn on this fan we'll see the, the fan or the air flowing and now we are going to switch to uh, cartesian nano edge studio so let me close the, the serial open the studio so the studio is a desktop software you can use on any uh, windows 10 pc or linux pc um, we will start by creating a project. I only have 20 minutes, so let's do it. Um, smart, uh, smart fan, let's name it the project. Our target could be an M0, M0 plus. We have the whole range of Cortex-M microcontroller available here, but we will use directly the, the board from ST because this board is available for free on the, the free demo of the studio. So you can do, redo the, the, the same uh, device on your, on your own for free, uh, starting at the end of this <laughs> webinar. The maximum quantity of RAM, let's put 16 kilobytes and see what the engine can do with that. No description need, needed. Um, the type of sensor, we are using a three axis accelerometer, but you can use current sensor, Hall effect sensors, generic sensor, if it's another kind of sensor, you can even combine sensors to create like a multi-sensor uh, signal if you want to monitor uh, complex things. So let's create the project. So the first step, we give uh, the studio the capacity we have uh, in our hands to, to create the, the device. Now, what we are going to do is give the studio some examples of the kind of environment, the kind of signal the engine will uh, need to, to address uh, in the future. So let's collect some data. We can use a, an already existing log file, but it's better to, to do it live. So let's connect to the, the port and say, okay, let's import uh, one of the lines, should be enough, and start recording. So here, uh, 
the, the board here, the main program inside, is in data logging mode. So it's just collecting the data from the accelerometer and sending it through the serial port to the studio. So you can see that uh, there are already uh, 27 lines that has been collected uh, from, by the studio. So maybe I can use a little bit of this time to answer some questions. I, I saw them on the... Yeah, we do. We have a few questions right now. So um, uh, let's... First question, seems like your target use cases could be run easily on a Cortex-M. Do you feel the need to add an NPU or accelerator? What, you, what use cases would that be for? We, the, the, the idea uh, was to be universal. So we are using only C code and, and we want to be compatible with the whole range of the Cortex-M family. So by design, we, we prefer not to use accelerators. And we don't need them. You will see that it's uh, already efficient enough. In the future, maybe we will create some specific libraries for specific hardware. But at that time, the, the main idea was to be uh, general. general. Yep. So we already import uh, those. So this is our nominal behavior from a fan. And here, the studio is going to check that everything is fine in terms of uh, content. I hope, and uh, give me some advice as a developer saying, okay, the, the file was not empty, you were, you, there were only numeric values, so it's fine. So it's uh, some helpers that try to and check for one column, constant, sample, duplicates, outliners, some things to help the developers. And here you have a preview of the signal, perfect. Let's go to the second, the third step. And now I'm going to collect an example of an anomaly. So here I'm going to use a very high tech solution that is the post-it. And I'm going to collect some lines from this uh, behavior that is not nominal, just to give some context to the search engine. Oh, no, it's not COM1, it's COM32. Let's do it again. Sorry for the noise, <laughs> if you can hear the post-it. Uh, so another question, how can the engine yeah. is choosing? Uh, so uh, what, what is your IDE based on, um, i.e. Eclipse, proprietary or, or other? No, it's uh, all made uh, based on, um, I don't remember the name of the GS, uh, JavaScript engine, but there is a front end in JavaScript and the back end is in C code. So it's C code, Python, and a lot of things. So. <laughs> that are involved. So there is not just one answer to that question. Um, and then quickly, another one, where does the firmware store the vibration data? Does it need a data flash? Uh, what's the minimum memory requirement, RAM and program flash? Okay, the, the, the model is going to be stored in RAM. That's why we set the quantity of RAM we want to allocate to the library. Uh, inside the, the definition of the project here, we, I, I say 16 max maximum for the engine, but I'm pretty sure that you will find a, a much better solution we will see in one second. So I can import my uh, abnormal signal and remove the post-it. So again, everything has been checked by the studio. So I go and go to the most uh, interesting part of the studio, that is the search engine. And we are going to start. So here, it will use the two signal, the information uh, I, I gave it uh, to um, when I define and just have to say validate. And here, what the engine is going to do is going to combine uh, like algorithm bricks from us in a smart way to find the better engine to train something, to train this kind of signal directly inside uh, uh, the Cortex-M microcontroller. So the first results are not very good. As you can see, the balance net accuracy is 50%. The confidence was, <laughs> was 30%. And the RAM was uh, two kilobytes. And we already, it already found a very, a pretty good uh, option here with a 97 balance accuracy, 100%, okay. So the balance accuracy is uh, the capacity to distinguish a good and a bad signal. The confidence is, like the distance 
the distance, the, the, the engine is going to be able to put uh, behind, uh, between uh, the good and the bad signal and the quantity of RAM, of course, you, you know it. And so, as you can see, it's improved, improving, it's improving the, the solution. We are not going to wait uh, till the end. We can already stop with that. I think it's enough for a, a demonstration. So now um, I already have, and here it will give the developer the amount of iteration recommended to, to, to learn. But as you can see, after 10 loops of learning, because it's an iterative learning. It's a learning function. The main program will call, I will call it like 20 times, for example, to create the model. Uh, so what we can do now is try this, uh, this library, this engine, directly inside the studio. Uh, so I, I leave the board as a data logging mode. And what I will do is send, uh, use the data flow inside the studio to emulate the library to check that it's uh, working fine. So here I can connect my serial data, say okay. And I will learn, like uh, I will do 30 iteration of learning. So let's hit record. The fan has no, nothing uh, uh, happening. So we can learn that behavior. So it's like directly inside the device, but it's not currently inside the device. It's inside my PC that is using an emulator. So here the learning is happening and we will, at the end of those uh, 30 lines, we will switch to inference and try to, to check that everything is working fine. So it's done. Let's go to detection, connect to the serial port. So now it's um, the inference that I saw, as you can see, it's 100% nominal here. And if I put my post-it, my fancy post-it here, can see that the signal is slightly different from what it was before I put that, if I can remove it uh, gently. So it's back to nominal. It seems that the engine is working fine. So let's use it now. So the last step is to deploy our library inside your, our device. So we just hit compile here. We choose development version for this demo. And here it will ask our server, please give me this specific library with this combination of algorithm. So I will save it, smart plan two. And it's uh, done for uh, studio for now. So what I can do is uh, go to download. It was a uh, smart fan two. So I receive a zip file from the studio, from our server with inside the library and the, the .h file and the emulators, you can use them in command lines and the documentation. So what I will do is remove those previous libraries inside my project and put the new ones. You can find all the code on, on our website uh, in tutorials, you can redo it and you don't have to do the main program by yourself if you want. So let's move them here. No. Oh, I have to unzip before and extract all. Let's do that and this to here. Okay, so I have the, the library inside my uh, main program project. And what I will do is uh, switch from data logging mode here to uh, device mode with the embedded uh, learning. And let's do 50 learning, uh, okay. The threshold we will define at 80%. If it's below 80% in terms of uh, similarity, we will trigger the, the red LED on the board. If not, uh, it will uh, flash uh, green, meaning everything is fine. And uh, you can see here, there is the initialization of the library here. So the library is initialized here initialized here and the data logging mode we don't care currently and here is the test mode so first we are going to do a learning loop uh, 40 times 50 times I don't remember the value uh, so filling the buffer from the accelerometer and send it to the nano learn function easy it's a loop 
And then we will uh, enter an infinite loop that is going to do the similarity test. So similarity nanoj detect using the buffer. And to be sure, I'll do it twice because it's very fast. So I prefer to be sure that it was not a small glitch in uh, if I hit my desktop or something like this. So, and if uh, the similarity is below the threshold, we flash uh, the, the red uh, light. And uh, otherwise it's a green light. So let's flash the board. And what we can do is use, let me switch to the, okay. So the board is flash without any problem. Let me switch to this view. So let's remove my PC cable and, and put my wonderful uh, homemade power bank. Not sure that I can char charge my phone with that, but it's enough for, for our device. So blinking blue means learning. So every time the, the blue light is blinking, meaning there is a new pattern that has been learned by the, the our new device. So it's blinking green, as you can see. You may see, I'm not sure uh, because of the webcam quality. If I put something here, you can see that an anomaly is detected. So it's fine. It works fine with this fan. Okay, fair enough. But if we had created a specific model, it will not work with another kind of fans. So let me put another example. It's a slightly different fan. What I will do is start the fan, reset the board, and as you can see, it's learning this new fan. So let it learn. And after the learning is done, so it's green, meaning that everything is fine. If I put, put it here, detect that something wrong happening and I can remove the post-it, it should go back to green. So I don't have to hit my disk. Okay. And now what we can do even better, maybe try to use the big boy. So this is a more challenging thing for it, the disco light for our sensor. So here you have two fans and they are working alternatively, one and the other one, the both of them. So let's try if we can learn that. So I fix the sensor here, I reset the board. Okay, so now it's learning that. It's very fancy on the webcam with those lights. So as you can see, it's green because everything is fine. And if I hit, the fan, the red light is here to tell me that something wrong happened. So basically we created together a, a smart sensor that is able to uh, learn and detect anomalies in this kind of environment in, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. I didn't uh, record the time. 25. 25. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Are you, uh, are you ready for a few more questions on this? Yes, I am. I'm totally mesmerized by that, by the way, Francois. It's really... Thank you. Great. Um, there is, uh, there's a question. Is there any possibility to retrain models on the fly? Yes, you can. You have a, a learn function you can call anytime you want in your main program. You can scratch the knowledge if you want. You can add some information to the model. Uh, and we had uh, some examples, some previous projects when, when it was useful. For example, a device that was monitoring pumps outside. The training was done during se uh, seven days in the winter. And it was a pump that, uh, a water pump. And when, the, when summer came, uh, the water density was slightly different. Uh, so there were like five to 10% anomalies, uh, uh, the similarity was a little bit less than usual but because only of the density of water. So they were able to send a signal. Uh, it was a LoRa network. So they, they can send a LoRa signal to the main program saying, okay, 
please run again, continue to learn during one day, for example, the new behavior, so it was added to the main uh, knowledge. That's awesome, over Laura, over Laura Wang. Yes. Wow. Yes, because uh -huh. it's only a command. It's like yeah. uh, you, you have to prepare the command. You, you have in the main program to, to be able to receive a command, but uh, otherwise it's easier, it's easy. Um, are you still adapting the model during the monitoring phase? Uh, what would be the consequence of doing so? No, you, you, you decide. As a developer, you decide what you want to do with the, the technology. The idea is we give you the function and you can use them. Uh, it will depend on your project. Some project needs uh, a very fast learning phase. Uh, it could be less than five minutes, like I did on the demo. And because it takes like 10 to 20 milliseconds to do a learning function to trigger the function on a Cortex M4, for example, you can do it uh, very quickly, <clears throat> but you will decide as a developer the way you want to device to learn, the, the choreography. I don't know if it's clear. Yeah. Uh, what's the max frequency <laughs> of sampling um, of a phenomenon the software can do? Mm. It's not about uh, the frequency. It's more, more about the, the quantity of data you will uh, send to the library. If you are using <coughs> huge buffers, like, I don't know, uh, for uh, 4,096 uh, uh, values per axis on an accelerometer, uh, maybe uh, Cortex uh, <laughs> M0 plus will uh, struggle a little bit with that. But uh, most of the time it's useless to, to use so, so big uh, buffers. You, you, can, you can manage to iterate quickly with smaller buffers. So you, you will find a, a way to do it, I think. Um, will the engine work for classifications other than uh, binary anomaly stroke model? No, the, the embedded engine, it's, so it's like a one class engine. Because, not because we can't do it, we can do it in the absolute. But it's challenging to imagine a project where uh, the device can uh, do the, the tagging live without any interface or with very harsh interfaces. That's why we focus first on predictive maintenance, security, everything that is uh, around. Let's define an environment that is nominal, that is normal, and then detect that we are going outside this environment. But, but, but we are going, uh, we are working on other kind of algorithms. So yeah. stay tuned. Um, any kind of benchmarking done? Uh, any, and any kind of be best practices uh, recommended based on the same? Uh, in terms of best practices? Uh, I'm assuming um, benchmarking on some of the, probably the performance of the models that you've- uh, Okay. We are, we are working on a benchmark uh, software that will run uh, some example of our algorithm. Uh, and we are going to benchmark different kind of Cortex-M to give you a, a, a good idea of what you can expect in terms of performance on every Cortex-M uh, available. Awesome. I'll look forward to that. Um, is there a way to know the details of the algorithms used for training? You can, but you have to buy the company. Perfect. Um, uh, would it make sense to exchange models between devices? I think you, you can. You can do it uh, because uh, we give you access to some functionalities that, that I, uh, give the, the inside the main program. You can import and export the model. But I think it doesn't make a lot of sense in reality uh, because the main idea of the, the preci precision we reach is based on a, a, a very good customization on the specific place where the, the device is working. So you will lose some precision if you do it like this, I think, at the end. Um. Can you apply your models also for voice? I think Joel touched on this um, in the beginning where you guys are not doing uh, voice or vision right now, but can this, can this be applied for voice? You can, you can, you can. If you want, you can, using our studio, um, you can do it uh, like this. On the studio, you can go back to 
this and choose a generic. I did it, that's why I'm sure that it works. You can choose generic one axis and send pixels as, a, as data. It works. I did, I did a, we did a, a, a small test just for fun uh, to, to, do, to learn a, vis, uh, a face and to detect that it's uh, that person to do a smart lock that can uh, unlock uh, only for the, the, the person. The results were like, 98, 97% uh, uh, positive. But uh, I don't really like the approach. It's, it's, I'm not sure. I, I prefer uh, not to encourage this. You can do it. You can test. Maybe you will find something interesting. But basically try it out. People. Yes, it's very easy. You just uh, check a generic uh, one axis and let's go. You can do that. You can do the test in five minutes. If you want. Um, so next question, if the device is turned off, uh, do we need to train it again? No, you, you don't have to because you, you have the capacity in your main program to uh, store in ROM the model if you want. So if you have a device that will not run on batteries, for example, so you may expect it to lose power, <clears throat> you can, in your main program, uh, prepare that and, and say, okay, just after the learning is done, let's extract the model, store it in ROM, and if I boot again, if I reset, I will check that there, there is already a model or not in ROM, and if there is one, I will load it in RAM using the functions that are available in the library. So yes, you can do it. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. So. Um, what about biomedical signals, like heart rate or things that are more complex? I, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, HVAC machine vibrating is less complex than a heart. So, yes, we, we don't do a lot of tests in the medical uh, area currently, but uh, you, you should, you should try. It, it's challenging for us to try every sensor possible. So. Yeah, yeah. Be yeah. my guest. Really, I appreciate if you if you try something and give us feedback. It will be a pleasure. If, and, and we have a whole team of engineers that can help you and to to go through your project. So yeah, there's there there are like unlimited use cases, right? So people <laughs> are you just try you know try it, see if it works. Uh, yes, that, 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 that was the main idea of the studio because at the beginning of Cartesian, we were okay. Let's do one project. That was Bob, the the, the small. Uh, uh, device that is uh, monitoring machines and we said okay if we are going to do it by hand every time by yourself we are going to be very limited because uh, <laughs> the team size so yeah. let's create something that will give the possibility to every embedded developer to do it by themselves that's why that's how the the studio came um which makes sense so you're you're limited only by your own imagination and your <laughs> ability to, to build these things. Um, let's see, a next uh, question. So um, the modeling is done on the workstations with the data for input model comes from the edge-based ARM Cortex-M device. Then the optimized model is sent to the edge device to run the inference engine on the edge. Is the edge device using TinyML or TinyML Micro or is it custom? No, no model is created on the, the studio. Here yeah, it's only examples. We give uh, the search engine to find the best learning engine, training engine that will run inside the micro microcontroller. Otherwise, it will be impossible for my device to learn this, uh, those fans based on an example on this fan. You, as you can see, it's not the same, <laughs> and they even run uh, differently. And so. No, no, the idea is to do the training inside the Cortex-M. So what we created using the studio, I'm sorry if that was, I was not clear, but we only created a learning engine and then we call it inside our main program, saying, okay, here first, Nano AGI learn with the buffer. I don't know if you can clearly see my screen, but Trust me, and you will see it in, in all the tutorial available online. There is a learn function, and then the detect function that is 
reaching for similarity. And uh, based on the similarity, we trigger the red light. Uh, you saw the red LED and green LED. So no training done uh, on the computer. There is no model. <clears throat> if we only start, for example, the detect function without any training, <clears throat> it will uh, mess up saying, OK, no, I don't have any model, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, are you done with the fan, by the way? Because it's a little, there's a little bit of background noise. And you want to do some more. Like this, better? No, no, couple the no. Ah, the sound. sound. OK, sorry. No problem. Um, we have a few more questions here. Uh, let's see. Um, this is interesting. What would the approach be to train a variable speed fan? Oh, you can. Yeah, I, I, I did it uh, on, on this example. There were two fans, so three speeds. More, you, you will need to add the transition speed. So, so yes, you can, you can run. Uh, the, the idea is to to be not sure, but to maximize the possibility that you, you will grab the information at every speed. So, yes, so you, yes. You, have to, you, you have to think your main uh, choreography, your main program, the way you are going to train the library. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned that you wrote all the algorithms um, and models to run efficiently on microcontrollers. Can you please give examples for models you have used? The example of models, models. Yeah, I'm not sure to understand the question. Yeah. Uh, Hassam, can you elaborate on that? Uh, possibly. Let me see. Maybe I can unmute Hassam if I can find him. Um, yeah. Here we go. Hassam, I'm going to uh, unmute you. So maybe you go ahead and uh, ask ask the question. Um, hello. Um, I just want to know, for example, the um, for image detection, we use the ResNet, uh, for example, um, as a model for training and on inference. So you have similar things, similar model. I mean, you are choosing from, right? Um, well, we 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 recreate from scratch some specific algorithm of training that are fully optimized for microcontroller to run on microcontroller. Because if you want to use a, a deep learning algorithm inside the Cortex-M, okay, maybe, but in inference only. Because in training, it's going to be uh, too much of a challenge for a Cortex-M microcontroller. So we recreate some lot of algorithm to be sure that they run perfectly on Cortex-M. Great. Um, not only, the, tra not only the, the inference, the training too. Uh, let's see, next question. So if um, we can probably open questions up for people to, to, to ask directly if you'd like. So if you just wanna hit the little hand thing in your controls, we'll, I'll get to you and you can talk directly to um, Francois and Joel. Um, in the meantime, or just keep typing your questions because I'll read them out as well. Uh, quick question that came kind of at the very beginning is, um, how does this compare with Facebook's upcoming GLOW? I don't know the details, so. So we'll have to look into that. Get back to you on that one. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a, a server-side model creation. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Based on the philosophy of Facebook. Um, another question. Uh, can you elaborate on the memory requirement for the learning? OK, so the, basically, the memory uh, needed in our example, it was, I don't remember the, the value, but it was like three kilobytes. Uh, and we, uh, we can have less than that sometimes. Uh, we can even have less than one kilobyte of RAM if the phenomenon is very light. So we are really uh, uh, in an optimization uh, strategy all the time, even for RAM, of course, and for Rome, it's not a lot to do. OK. Um, we've got a, a live question from uh, Pavance. So uh, go ahead. I've unmuted you. Uh, answer your, um, please ask your question. 
normally we want to deploy in edge devices we convert using tensorflow to tensorflow lite which format you are using for deploying uh, devices uh, tensorflow lite uh, micro uh, is a, uh, a tool to create static models so it's more uh, uh, what i present as uh, the classic machine learning approach here you can use a uh, Uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro, if you grab all the data needed to fit the whole world of your project, most of the time it's a challenge that nobody can, can reach, but uh, okay, maybe. And then you can use TensorFlow Lite here to create this model that you will use inside your uh, devices. But if your model doesn't fit uh, with uh, another fan, in my example, Uh, you will have to grab the data, update the model, and update all your devices. So, yes, you can. I think most of the time, TensorFlow Lite makes sense when you, the phenomenon are limited. Like, like, if you want to detect human faces, okay, it will not change a lot in the next uh, million year, years. So, you are okay with that. Uh, and even uh, it doesn't work very well <laughs> sometimes. So, uh, but if you don't know exactly the shape of the signal you are going to learn, how can you be sure to create the model that will fit all the, all the possibilities? It's almost endless, the real life. The reality is almost endless. That's why it makes a lot more sense to embed an engine that will learn locally. And we saw it with, with Bob, the client of Bob, put Bob on the same, the same device with the same algorithm, the same engine inside, has been uh, um, monitoring a variety of engine electro pumps, a hashback, a compressor around the world. And it's, there is no one model that can fit all of those behaviors. But because it was with a good engine inside, it runs perfectly. Yeah, that's a big difference versus, uh, I would say, the, the, the other solutions on the market, uh, which are very good for some cases. In our case, we do the learning directly on the equipment. Because like Francois said, uh, it's quite impossible to anticipate all the equipment of the world and create a static model that is going to fit uh, all the models or all the pumps or all the fans or etc. And you so, even have to be sure that your device is going to be installed correctly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In real life, there is always something, a cable, uh, something you, oh no, we don't put it here, you should put it there. But no, the model is not uh, for that. So, okay. So, Uh, we've got one more question. We're, we're um, officially out of time, but we said we would hang out here for a little while. So um, Tarek, you're, uh, you're on to ask a question. And if there's anybody else that have uh, questions, please raise your hand now um, so we can get them in in the next few minutes. So Tarek, go ahead. Tarek, we can't hear you. Your headset might not be working. Going once, twice, all right. Let's move to Hassam. Hassam, go ahead. So I uh, just want to confirm again so about the model. So it is mainly binary classification model. Is this correct? It's a one I mean, class, yes. Binary, bi binary classification. This is, this is all about, right? One class, nominal. Okay, so you, you can interpret nominal the way you want. It's a, a mathematical term to say, okay, one class. Uh, but because sometimes uh, what you will uh, in your project, the idea was to, f to, to, to alarm when we are nominal. We, we did a project, it was reverse, uh, the reverse logic. They say, okay, abnormal is usual, but when we reach something, meaning, Uh, we are in the norm, and here we, we should send a signal. So you can use it uh, the way uh, you want. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just a bit confused because you have mentioned that um, the engine is searching, for, we are actually searching for 500 million algorithms, something like that. Yes, right. the, 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 this value came from all the combination possible in terms of, because how mathematicians are creating algorithm bricks, okay? And, and there are tons of them that are uh, developed specifically for Cortex-M. And the, what the engine is doing, the search engine here, uh, when we are uh, inside the uh, project, at that step, here the engine is combining those bricks, algorithm bricks, in a smart way. And the possibilities in terms of combination is the, the value you, you said, the, the Joel said. Because it, it's easy to go high. With, uh, when you multiply. Cool. Thank you. Um, hopefully that answered uh, your question, Hassan. Let's take another one um, from uh, Teresa. You're on. Uh, hi. So if I understood correctly, what you do is to train and deploy in the same, reading from the same device. So it's like, uh, you are overfitting for that specific device. No, because we, we didn't train. We just find the, the, the engine that will train on the device. And we, I flash the library here inside the, the, the main code. I drop it here, libnoe.a, but this library doesn't have any model inside. It's only the learning engine and the inference, of course. So when, when I start, when I reset my board, uh, the, when I reset the board, it uh, enters the learning loop and creates locally inside the, the board the, the model using this function. Okay, but the could you swap and use another fan without changing anything in the board? Yeah. Uh, I did it. Th that's what we did, actually. It was the same microcontroller with the same library. And Francois, after flashing the, the library inside the, the microcontroller, has been using this on different fans. And the, the fans are... Uh, use the, this fan friend. to, to create the... To to, to train and not to train. <laughs> Be careful with that. <laughs> I use that to, to define, to find using the studio, the, the learning engine, the training engine that will run inside the microcontroller. But after that, I switch from that fan to this one, it is slightly different, and to the big boy here which are a little bit more compact with two fans that are not perfectly aligned as you can see. So and they are running one and the other. So it's a little bit more challenging for the uh, learning engine to, to learn this uh, phenomenon, but it's okay, it's fine. Um, all right, we've got, wow, we've got about five or six more questions. So let's try to get through them um, in the next maybe five minutes. So um, let's see. Uh, um, Tarek, let's try to get you um, back here. Uh, I lost my... If there are more questions, and people can send us a, a mail to contact at cartesian.com and we'll be happy to answer even after the webinar, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Tarek, go ahead, you're muted. Let's go ahead and ask your question. And we still can't hear you, so I'll give you a minute. Um, okay, let's move on to Anath, uh, go ahead. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, my question was uh, when uh, this 
particular microcontroller is kept on the next fan, right? A different fan. How does it know when to learn? When to learn, and how does it know which is normal and which is not normal after it is set to a new device, a new fan? In this example. Okay, we we give them the context setting in our main program as a developer. I decide that the first it's like uh, 10 seconds your machine is going to be nominal because you just uh, fix it or you just buy it uh, so the, your, your machine is working fine you assume that uh, your machine is working fine so it's not like we don't give any context we are giving the the, the, the software a context that is okay the first period is uh, everything is fine and everything that is not fine is going to be an anomaly. And the distance uh, is going to be uh, uh, quantified by the library to say, okay, if it's something slightly different or completely different from usual. So you can, as a main developer of your device, you can decide what kind of action you want. On my demo, I only use the uh, LED uh, because <laughs> I only had 20 minutes to create a device. But uh, of course, you can connect that to a network. You can send the information to a dashboard. You can uh, flash a, a bright light for the technician to react using a buzzer, whatever you want, because uh, the rest of the story is more uh, business as usual for, for embedded developers. We give you the, math the mathematic part, the, the machine learning part of the project, and that is Usual usually takes one year, two years to collect data, prepare the model and everything. Here, we, you can do it in a matter of days. Uh, next question. So Francois, you're good for about maybe one or two more questions and then we probably need to wrap it up and let everybody get going to their day. So um, Mayank, uh, go ahead, you're, you're on. Yeah, hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yep. So, uh, so, yeah, I have a machine uh, which can have multiple anomalies like say a bent shaft or a loosened screw or overloaded. So can I build a model using Nano Edge AI which can detect these multiple anomalies? And uh, to, to add, if the answer is no, is there a possibility of adding multiple models to the same uh, source code or so, so that I can actually when there's anomaly in one model, I can, you know, go back and look at another model and maybe have four different models and, and try to figure out, you know, where the exact match is. Okay. We, we don't train for anomalies. So every abnormalies is going to be find by, by, uh, found by the library. The, the test I did, uh, for example, I, I, I give an example to the studio using a post-it, but then when I test on this, I, I just hit uh, slowly the, the fan to, to slow it so it's a different kind of anomaly and it was uh, the, there is no problem for the, uh, the library to detect uh, those kind of anomalies. So the main idea is to say, okay, first step, you have to be sure that you will find every anomaly. And using the, our library, you can do it because there is one norm and everything else is an anomaly. But what you can do if you want to go to the next step of smart uh, devices, embedded learning devices, what you can do is use our library as a smart data logger that will collect only the interesting signals and leave the common uh, behavior uh, business as usual from your machine that doesn't interest anybody. And, and only send, for example, or store locally or send using a network only the, the anomalies. And then you can flag them. You can prepare your whole data set for the next step of the project that will be embedded uh, qualification of the, of the anomalies. And here you can send back your, an upgrade to your devices saying, OK, first, we want to detect there is something interesting. So you already know how to do it using our library, and then you will ask another library, is it something we already know in terms of anomaly? And this library you create using the smart data logger 
you can, you can reply, yes, it's a bearing problem. We know it seems like this, or it may be a shaft problem. I don't know. <laughs> There is a quantity of types of anomalies in the industry, it's almost infinite. So it's a two-step project. First, you want to be sure that uh, you can detect anomalies and then you want to qualify them. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks. So we've got, we'll take two more questions. We've got uh, Pavansai and Huawei, so we'll get to you and then um, we'll probably uh, wrap it up. Um, so let's see, um, Pavance, go ahead, you are on. Hi, uh, is there, can you tell some techniques to optimize on my model to deploy in uh, very light microcontrollers? We, we, we are not uh, um, something to uh, embed a pre-existing model. This is not the, the purpose of our solution. If you want to, to optimize and to embed a model that you created before using, I don't know, TensorFlow Lite, whatever, on your server, PC, uh, you should use the, the available tools uh, from ARM and from other providers to convert it to embed to microcontroller. But it's, it's only going to be in inference. No, you, will, uh, you are in this... Uh, this, appro this approach here. You want to convert. I have, to I have another question. Presently, so many people worried about the corona. I have one problem. Uh, to detect corona with the help of uh, patient voice, is it possible to do this, uh, tackle this problem with Nano, your tool? I'm very sorry, but I'm not sure to, to have understood uh, correctly the question. I have one problem regarding Corona. I want to identify a person with the help of voice of his per person. Is it possible to tackle this type of problem with your tool? You you, you can uh, do uh, you can you can imagine some a device like I I, I explained uh, about a video test I we did we we did a smart lock that was able to learn by itself the 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 person the proprietary of the the owner, uh, sorry, of the, the lock, and to unlock only when this person is in front of the camera. So, yes, you can use, uh, you may uh, uh, use. The only limit I can see is that the current approach is uh, limited to one person because you will have just one norm. So it will be the owner. Not sure if it's clear. Um, all right, I think uh, we had one more question, but it looks like they've disappeared. So let's wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Joel. They're, they're, they're back, Mary, they're back. Say again? The, um, they're back, the Huawei uh, piece, Mark. Okay, Huawei, you're back. Okay, we'll take one more question. Um, so go ahead, uh, Huawei, you're on. You need to unmute yourself. You're I don't need. Hello. Go, go ahead, Huawei. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I ask uh, two questions about uh, the model. Uh, one is about the uh, number of layers uh, inside your network, and uh, the second is about the data type inside the network, for example. Uh, flow 32 int 8 or uh, something like that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, number of layers is not uh, uh, relevant here because we are not uh, doing deep learning of whatever uh, those kind of uh, algorithm. So, and, and I don't have the answer because the studio will give me the answer. We give, we'll create this, the library that will uh, uh, use those tools and we don't need to have this information as embedded developer. I don't care. I want something that is uh, running. Um, the second question about we can we can address uh, uh, every numerical uh, kind of uh, value. So float, no float, uh, whatever. We will uh, deal with it. No problem. Thank you. 
Um, I think we're out of time. Um, we do have some more questions that came in. So we'll go ahead and um, answer those, continue to answer those and um, make them available when you can download the presentation. Um, Joel Francois, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, it was really, really uh, in a great presentation. I hope everybody learned a lot. Please contact Cartesium. Go and download and try the studio at uh, cartesium.ai. There's the URL right there in the screen. Please check it out. Um, this is some exciting, very cutting edge technology and machine learning. Um, so I encourage you to all, all try it out. Um, give them some feedback, make some projects. You know, maybe it's something we could talk about at some time uh, in the future. Um, so I think that's it for today. Uh, we will have the, the replay of this available on the ARMS YouTube channel in probably about two days. Uh, and on the uh, Tech Talk series page where you registered, um, you will be able to find a copy of the slide deck that was used today that you can go ahead and download. And please register for future sessions. We have a lot of really um, great content coming up um, in the next few weeks. Um, so uh, check this space. Um, we're always adding new content. And again, we want to hear from you. So fill out the webinar uh, survey. Let us know how we did. Let us know about things you want to hear about. And yeah, I think that's it. So thanks again. Have a really great day. Rest your day, evening, wherever you are in the world. And uh, we'll see you again here soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.